Hi, I'm Darren Peppard. Welcome to the Leaning into Leadership podcast, the podcast dedicated to today's hardworking leader. Join me every Sunday for leadership insight, inspiration, and a little pep talk to keep you rolling down your road to awesome. Transformational change with sustainable impact is easier said than done in any organization, and establishing sustainable impact in education could be argued as even more challenging. In fact, I would say we know that change is probably the only constant in education. And so today on the show, episode 124 of the Leaning Into Leadership podcast, my guest is Dr. Christina Mattis. And Dr. Mattis is truly an expert in transformational change, having written the book recently released, Guiding Transformational Change in Education. And Dr. Mattis currently advises statewide educational technology efforts for the California Department of Education, specifically addressing the Closing the Digital Divide initiative to achieve digital equity. Christina's 20 plus years in education spans roles from classroom teaching to executive director and from strategic plan development to leading change and project management across public and private instructional institutions. She is an ESL multilingual speaker. She's a published author. And Christina's expansive experience and expertise in educational initiatives really allow her collaborative and holistic systems thinking approaches to examining the needs for high quality, equitable access to the necessary technologies to propel our institutions and our students forward in education. Folks, I'm really excited about this conversation that I had recently with Dr. Mattis. Christina and I sat down, we talked about change, we talked about education, and we talked about leadership specific to the context of change. You're really going to enjoy this conversation. You're going to get the whole thing right after this. Hello, middle level educators. Are you looking for a nationwide type of conference at the fraction of the cost? The North Carolina Association for Middle Level Education welcomes you to Charlotte, North Carolina, March 24th through the 26th for the 2024 NCMLE Inspire Conference. My name is David James, NCMLE Marketing and Conference Director, and I want to personally invite you to our annual conference. You will not want to miss our keynote and featured speakers that lead over 120 middle-specific teaching and learning sessions. Our featured speaker lineup includes EDU experts from across the country, such as principal and leadership expert Baruti Kefele, Charles Williams, LaQuanta Nelson, Zach Bowermaster, and the host of the Leaning Into Leadership podcast, Dr. Darren Peppard. The NCMLE Inspire Conference is for everyone. Go to ncmle.org to register your team for the 2024 NCMLE Inspire Conference today. Throughout the course of my leadership career, there were many things that changed, many things that um, were necessary to change. And oftentimes, the only constant, as we know, uh, in our lives is that there is change. So how do you successfully lead change in an organization? That's the big challenge. As leaders, that's one of the most complicated things that we will take on. And honestly, one of those things that can help determine whether or not we're successful in the role that we're in. Joining me on the show today is Dr. Christina Mattis, who is absolutely the expert or one of the experts in that change. She is the author of the new book, Guiding Transformational Change in Education. Dr. Christina Mattis, thanks for joining me here on Leaning Into Leadership. Thanks for having me here. It's a total honor and privilege. Well, I'm I'm really excited about this conversation and, you know, I guess for my listeners, I will provide a little bit of transparency. Christina and I have known each other for a while. Uh, Road to Awesome actually is the publisher of this brand new book, and it's an absolutely fantastic book. And we're going to get into it. We'll talk about it in here in just a little bit. Um, certainly, again, that's something that all leaders deal with, is that that constant 
change. And and I love how you talk about it in the book. Again, we'll get to it in a few minutes, but that, that we can't be focused on change just for the sake of change, but that there really is a process. And if we follow a process, if we're really intentional, we really increase the likelihood that change can be of success. So let, let's start here, Christina. Let's maybe um, back it up a decade or two as far back as, as you would like to go. And let's talk um, a little bit about your background, a little bit of your history, whatever it is you feel like you'd like to share with the listeners to the show so they can kind of get oriented on on who Christina Mattis is. Sure. Well, uh, again, uh, thanks for having me here with you today and, and hi to all the listeners and viewers. I started out as a pretty traditional high school classroom teacher because I thought you know, if you go into education, you are pretty much a teacher and administrator, right? I was very limited in my perspective. Uh, but over time in meeting new people and attending different educational conferences, I started to realize that there is more to education. And so uh, guide, uh, growing into educational technology and then transitioning through different roles in education, I ultimately um, ended uh, my tenure at a quite large urban school district in the Bay Area, uh, working and focusing on change management and supporting systems implementations uh, as a change manager. And having had the skill set in project management and program management along the way uh, through other systems implementations, it really opened up my eyes and realized that in education, we are certificated and credentialed and professionally developed you know, day in and day out. And yet very few people in the field of education are trained as project or change managers. And given how much change happens, in organizations, right? Uh, same in education. And so how do you have somebody to really help guide what change looks and feels like, ideally in a successful way where you do have the people brought on board um, and, and are excited for that change to happen? So, so that's where I'm at right now. I, uh, yeah. and, and so that, you know, and so that's kind of like that, sorry, that was kind of just like where that, that uh, spark happened for the book, um, coming to, to realize that bringing those two worlds together of reading change and education, how do you bring that together that's easy and, um, and, and fun for people? I think that's incredible because, you know, again, change is just this continued, you know, thing that we, we we're always dealing with. But what I really like about what, what you're talking about there is focusing on it in terms of that actual project management and that project leadership. Because I know for me, certainly, you know, from from the time as whether it was AP, superintendent, principal, um, I certainly did not have any training around the project management element. And, you know, watch, uh, I'll go back to my time specifically as a principal and watching our superintendent do what many superintendents eventually do, which is argue for either passing a bond or uh, in a state like Wyoming, where I was a principal, where uh, the state is going to pay for your buildings, but you still have to go through the process of, you know, getting your way up the list or whatever, whatever it is. I mean, ultimately, as a superintendent, he became you know, like a construction manager, right? Because you're overseeing all of those things. And so many times I think in, in educational leadership, when we talk about project, that might be what we think about. Oh, okay, we're going to build a new building or we're going to, you know, whatever. But but when you talk about project, it's so many different pieces. I mean, like before you and I hit record, uh, we were talking about your current role with, with the California Department of Education. And who a big project that you're working on. So talk a little bit about projects in general. Like when, when you talk about project management, it, it isn't always that, oh, I'm a superintendent, I gotta build a new building. It's more than that. Talk, talk some about that. Sure, uh, 
projects are essentially um, brought on that ultimately have an impact um, on certain stakeholders, uh, a group of people, right? Someone's going to be impacted. And so thinking, uh, you know, something basic like a password chain, that can be and, and should be defined as a project because there's also a deadline to it. You know, you got to change your password by a certain deadline, right? Well, you can consider that as a project along with change. And it's thinking about uh, how far in advance are you communicating that this change is forthcoming? What details are needed to successfully change your password? Um, you know, is there... A, you know, whatever else might be happening with that password change project, you have to think about what are those conditions and structures that you're going to put into place to make sure that people actually follow through and you provide the supports and you've got the follow-ups even after, say, you've flipped that switch of, okay, today was the deadline to get your password changed, now what, right? So that's a, a very basic example, but that is considered a project for sure. So uh, I, I just think that's just so fascinating that, uh, and, and I love how you do that. I mean, we, we really should be looking at all of those different things that need to take place really as, as projects. And when you, when you take it from that perspective, um, I think my, my big takeaway uh, listening to you talk about there is just really getting into the details and being focused on the specific details of what needs to happen you know, what, what if it doesn't happen? How do we follow through on that? That was so much of what I really took away in the book was, you know, just all of the details that go into projects. So, so what I want to ask you about connected to that is in many ways, at least my takeaway is you are very self-taught in the project management space. I know you've done a lot of research, you, you've, you've had some good mentors, but in many cases, all of the project management stuff, all this, this transformational change that you're talking about really comes from your experience. Talk, talk a little bit more about how some of those experiences have helped to shape your view of leading change. Absolutely, and I think that that gets back to the, the impetus for the book of, you know, we, um, we don't come into our jobs 100% knowing all the skills that we eventually need to know. And so you're right, this was a lot of on the job training and, and learning. Um, and thinking about trial and error, right? And it's that art and the science. If you can learn the, the frameworks and the guides, the science part of it, then you can start mixing and matching and bringing in more of that art to the project management and the change management. And even thinking about, you know, to your question earlier about my, my project right now within my current role with the California Department of Education, um, we are truly focused on the superintendent's closing the digital divide initiative under which we want to ensure that digital equity is achieved for each and every of our students in the state. And at the heart of it, it's, getting our kids connected at home to the eligible households. And there's this wonderful program called the Affordable Connectivity Program um, that allows for discounted rates on internet services to eligible households. What was fascinating to me in a recent conversation is that we partner with many wonderful organizations who are also looking to achieve this, this similar goal, but yet, uh, everyone's doing it differently through their set upon, you know, their perspectives and what they think, you know, how to execute to achieve that success looks like, right? But what I was uh, told or, you know, what was shared with me was that there's no one person overseeing the, the execution and the success of this project. It is, um, you know, we all have a common goal, but we're all doing it differently. And I think that, you know, when you look at projects and leading change, you do need to have one person truly who is assigned to oversee the day in and day out tasks, 
not in the micromanaging way, but just make sure that things yeah. are getting done, right? Uh, and that there is a plan. Uh, you've got, you know, team pulse checks and meetings, and you've got your status reports to the sponsoring committee of the project, whatever it is, you need someone who can actually see the forest perspective and really help guide everybody, um, you know, being in that same boat, rowing in the same direction. Um, and so, uh, you know, even with, with the Department of Education and, and working toward household connectivity, it's also, you know, we need to make sure that there is that sustainable funding source as well. And so working with our uh, government agencies and our federal agencies, all those who are contributing to making sure that uh, our kids really do get what they need, what the funds needed. Um, and so I think that that just brings it home that you've got projects, um, got to have somebody who is actually overseeing each and every project too. So let's let's pretend that um, I am a brand new superintendent, um, or that, and and this is probably true of somebody in the listening audience, probably more than we realize. But you're brand new into a leadership role. I'm going to say I'm a brand new superintendent, okay? And I I've got to figure out how do I how do I manage change in this role. And I'll be honest with you, Christina, when I was hired as a superintendent, one of the things that I was told was, you know, from the board, you know, we, we have to move forward, Darren. We're ready for change in the district. Now, that's a wonderful thing to say, but it's also a frightening thing, you know, especially when you're not sure exactly, okay, what is it that I'm supposed to change here? But right. um, even, even if somebody is brand new in the role, let's say I'm that brand new superintendent and I know that... Um, some of the changes that are required might be we need to completely redo and update our website. We need to look at our communication plan. Our safety plan is outdated or non-existent. Uh, yeah. Fill in the blank, right? There can be all kinds of things when somebody new comes into a role. Mm -hmm. as, the, as, as somebody who also serves in, in a bit of a consultant role, uh, has done mm -hmm. that work before, what advice would you give me or anybody who's new in one of those roles that's going to be overseeing change? What, where do we start? What is, what is some advice that, that you would have related to change? Brilliant question, Darren. Um, first and foremost, please don't think that you're, uh, you should be coming into that new leadership role with a... Uh, predetermined agenda of what needs to change and how to change it, that you have to, number one, talk to the people. Uh, get as much representation from the, the those in your organization, at your school, at your district, in the community, get those voices represented as much as possible, including student voice. We so often forget students, um, and we don't often necessarily think that you know, they're impacted too. Um, they just might be. Maybe not your kindergartners or first graders, who knows, but um, you want to talk to everybody. And, you know, um, think about those empathy interviews through design thinking. Ask the people, you know, like what's working well? What are areas that could use some improvement? Uh, just leave it very open-ended and as a leader it'll be on you to then synthesize what you heard from talking to people um, but then you have the great opportunity to go back to the community and say this is what i heard right and you can show them these are the areas that are working well you know we got to shine some bright spots you know it's not that everything is not working well and that everything needs change it's just Let's highlight what's good. And then you can bring about, okay, what are those areas for improvement? And then you can really think about, well, one, on the side of what's working well, you can even bring in of the, the questions of, well, how do we make sure that those things continue to work well, right? What's needed to sustain that? Let's not forget about the good. And then with the areas of improvement, you can first think about, well, 
okay, if everything's a priority to change, then nothing's a priority to change, right? So bring it a step back and say, so what would be the sequence to these priorities? It's not that, you know, we're going to say no, it's just we have to think about in which order should we then address each of these then uh, improvement areas and, and priorities. We will return to the Leaning into Leadership podcast in just a moment. But first, let me ask you a question. Have you ever said to yourself, man, I should write a book? Well, if you have, then let me ask you another question. What's holding you back? What keeps you from taking the step that moves you from, I have an idea about a book, to I am a published author? From experience, I would bet it's probably you're wondering who would even want to read a book that I wrote. Maybe you're questioning the idea. Is it unique enough? Is it valid enough? Is it good enough to be a book worthy of having published? Hey, as a best-selling author myself, I can tell you most writers have had the exact same feelings at some point in time during their writing journey. Here at Road to Awesome, we believe in cultivating leaders by elevating voices and promoting positivity. And a part of that work is publishing books for educators by educators. Go to roadtoawesome.net and hit the Contact Us button to set up a free, no-obligation conversation about your book idea. Hey, educators, we've all had incredible experiences. We all have amazing stories, and every one of them deserves to be told. Go to roadtoawesome.net, hit the Contact Us button. Let's have that conversation about your book idea. And now, back to the Leaning into Leadership podcast. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. I think what you're talking about there, Christina, is just so important. You know, new, pe- new people will come into a role and so frequently, and I, I know I've made this mistake, I know what needs to be fixed. You know, there's, there's this thing about, about being in that, leader's, you know, in that leader's role that makes us believe that we're the ones who has the answer, right? You know, we, we have the answers. We know what needs to happen, and we're just going to set out to go and get it done. So that listening to her, I think, is really important. And, and maybe that's, uh, that's the best place for a brand new leader to start in terms of starting to look at change. But what if, what if I'm someone who's now not that person who just started in a new superintendent role, but I'm a leader within my, within my community, within my school, but I don't have a title per se. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe I'm not the principal, maybe I'm not the superintendent, but I'm still going to have some opportunity to lead on projects. So let's talk a little bit about leading without positional authority. What what does that look like? And what's what are some uh, pieces of advice you would have for people in that type of a situation? Yeah, exactly. Because I think about all of the, for instance, teachers on special assignment that are brought in from the classroom or school into a district office to help support a special assignment, a, a special project, right? And, um, you know, I remember as a teacher on special assignment, it was, you know, oh, you know, get everybody trained up on X, Y, Z. Well, that training can be considered a project, right? I didn't have a title as manager or director or, you know, chief of X, Y, Z. I was a teacher on special assignment. I wasn't in a leadership position per se, but I was tasked with then leading a project. And, um, That's when it's a wonderful opportunity to gain experience to effectively lead and communicate vertically and horizontally. It's, um, you know, that that vertical communication with those in positional authority can be intimidating until you get that experience to work together and um, even leverage those opportunities to further grow, you know, and through your mentorship opportunities. So um, yeah, does that kind of make sense where, you know, you yeah. might be a leader, but you are a leader? Oh, absolutely. It does. And I think I love that you talk about TOSIS because that is something that's 
just so frequent in districts across the country Mm -hmm. that, you know, maybe maybe I can't add an additional administrator, but I can, you know, teach her on special assignment. Um, I I can still give them some positional authority without necessarily having some title that, you know, is, yeah, you know, a chief of this or manager of that or director of, of what have you. Um, definitely something that we see quite frequently across the board in, in education. So plenty of people who I know um, understand exactly where you're coming from, you well, know, being and, in those spots where, yeah. Yeah, well, and to that, Darren, it's um, so frequently also we don't see, well, and I really don't know what at the heart of it is, but because there is that lack of training of how to lead a project and then see it to fruition, it's that reinforcement and that reiteration of that project once it then becomes a program, it's launched, right? And so who's going to sustain it? The reason why I bring that up is because not often do you see an exit strategy, for instance, for that TOSA to return back to the classroom, right? We know that projects have a definitive deadline. You know, there's a launch date, that go live route. And then um, without having that exit strategy uh, for the TOSA to then go back to the classroom to return to the students, uh, that TOSA then takes on another project and another project and another project. What I would even recommend is once that project has launched, perhaps use that opportunity to professionally grow the TOSA, should the TOSA actually want to do this, and allow them to take on that program manager role, um, make space for new TOSAs to come in, and now you've got a program manager, someone to actually oversee that reinforcement of that now program, whatever has been launched, right? Because you need somebody to continue supporting the users and um, and just to make sure that there's sustainability to making sure that that whatever that program is now is truly internalized within the district or the school or whatever organization there is. So TOSAs are valuable. We just need to make sure that they have the necessary skill sets and toolkits um, to see that those special assignments fo- get followed through on, and then also think about what's going to happen on the back end. But I think a big part of that goes to leadership and, and having that big picture view and, and being two or three steps down the road. Uh, one thing I really admired about the superintendent who hired me to be a building principal, I felt like he was always three or four steps, three or four chess moves ahead of everybody else who was at the board. Mm-hmm. Um, by far and away, the best person I think I've ever been around in terms of just knowing the big picture and having those steps ready to go well before before they ever came about. Um, what I what I want to have you talk about a little bit here is kind of that that intersection, that that person who is overseeing that whole thing like like I'm talking about with with my first superintendent mm-hmm. and that that support process that you're talking about. I mean, in essence, that in and of itself is a project. It's like that person is overseeing that entire project. Mm -hmm. How does a person do that effectively? And I know it goes to detail and I know it goes to being, you know, being thinking about all those different elements. And in essence, this is leading you right into talk about your book because your book basically lays this out for us, Mm -hmm. how you do this. Talk a little bit about that. How how do we ensure that we are three or four steps ahead and that we really are managing change and not that change is managing us? Yes, that is where I would say you've got the art and the science working so synchronously. And I would also say that depending on the size of the project, that it is adequately staffed because then, it, you know, if it's quite large by whatever the definition is, you would probably need an assigned project manager and then a second person who is working in lockstep with that project manager as the change manager. Because you've got somebody who is more than on that science side of executing the project, but then you need someone who's more on that intuitive 
art side working with the people. And um, that can't happen without the other. And so even as I mentioned in the book, they are distinctly different roles. They're like cousins, essentially. You, they're related. They're different, but related. And you need to have that all working um, truly in, in tandem. Um, and so really, um, for someone who is brand new to this and overseeing the forest, you want to make sure that someone actually understands all those nuances that come into play. In essence, what you're saying is it's about communication. I, I know you talk about the communication in the book a lot. And, um, you know, one of the things I really enjoyed about this particular book was not only all the, those specific details, but specifically in communication, all those different touch points, all those different meetings. And I mean, you even go so far as to give guidance on, you know, probably the first meeting should be about this long. And then after that, you need about this much time. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about the communication piece. Um, and how you outline that in the book, because I think ultimately, when it comes to any change management, communication is ultimately going to be the most important piece. Absolutely. And communication is so underrated. And you want to communicate in the offense more than you do in the defense, right? And so stay ahead of it, go through some predictions. Um, even when, you know, to your last question of how do you successfully see a project through, you know, start looking at what are the risks and what are people most nervous about and most apprehensive about and think about anything that could go wrong and plan for it, right? It's the same with having those communications all written out, templated, ready to go as a plug and play um, along the way. And thinking about you know, you've got all these people who are going to be impacted that you've identified by this change. Take a look at what are they excited about, but also what's making them nervous and calm their nerves and really think about what are the benefits of the change? Because you will have change resistors, those who just don't, they are anxious about it. They're nervous about it. They're scared about it. They don't know what might happen on the back end. And so how can you help calm everybody through your communications. Also knowing that email isn't the one and only communication platform out there. You know, you've got um, text messages, you've got the auto dialers, you can do some analog communications, town hall meetings, flyers and, you know, the, the learning in the loop concept. Uh, you can really get creative on how you can reach all your different audiences, right? Because the one type of platform may not be the best way. And, and I've even had, you know, IT directors like, well, but I've emailed so many times and no one's doing what I'm telling them to do. Well, chances are that email is long gone. No one's paying attention to it. You've got to reach people how they are best reached. I think that's just such a critical element right there. You know, when just because we communicated a certain way doesn't necessarily mean that it is received. Such such an important, important piece. And honestly, something that that we all probably should have learned um, as classroom teachers, you know, as teach it one way doesn't mean it's necessarily received. You got to find other ways to to reach the recipient and the, the communication is, is equally as important. So let, let's do this uh, at this point, Christine. I, I definitely want to get to the last question that I ask everybody here on the show. But before I do that, um, I, we've talked about some different elements of the book. We've talked about you know some of the different pieces that are there. Just tell the listeners about you know, about the book itself, like specifically you know, from, from A to Z, here is what this book really is for. Oh, wow. Um well, I would say this book is 100% for anyone in education who is tasked with leading a project or even being part of a project, seeing something change, um, but who does not have formal training uh, to do so. And this is a guidebook. It's a step-by-step -step guidebook filled with not just the frameworks and, and the research, the science part of it, but also anecdotes, the art of it. Uh, bringing in personal experience of, you know, where 
I think I did well based on what I was told and then areas that I didn't do well along the way and hoping to share those aha moments so that you don't make those same mistakes I did along the way either. Yeah, and, and it's a fantastic book. It really is. So, okay, so let's get let's get to that question. This is the Leaning Into Leadership podcast, Christina. So right now, what are you doing to lean into leadership? Uh, interestingly enough, in the roller coaster of uh, working in education, you know, I, I started as the classroom teacher, like I said, and then moved all the way up to executive director and then went into consulting for a little bit. And now I'm in a position where I don't have that positional authority leadership. I am leading without positional authority. And so it's refreshing to be back into that area. Uh, and so leaning into leadership without positional authority, that's that's huge because you realize how many people you need to help bring about change. And you can't work on an island. You can't work in isolation. You need to be and work with people. Excellent stuff. So I'm sure that there are going to be people who want to reach out, have a conversation with you, um, talk with you about your book, maybe even ask you for, for some guidance, for some advice, for some support for people who need exactly that kind of training. Mm -hmm. How do people get in touch with you? The easiest way would be through my LinkedIn page. Uh, and I think um, that would be the best to just message me on there. And then for any additional information about uh, support services, uh, definitely check out my website, consultedevelopment.org. And we will make sure that those are linked in the show notes, folks, so you can go and get connected with Dr. Christina Mattis. The book, Guiding Transformational Change in Education, is available, also linked for you in the show notes. Dr. Mattis, thank you so much for joining me here on Leaning Into Leadership. Thank you. It's been a blast. Such a fantastic conversation with Dr. Mattis. Make sure, folks, you go down there in the show notes and hit the link. Go grab a copy of her book. Get connected with Dr. Mattis. Uh, believe me, you are absolutely going to appreciate spending some time with Christina and having conversations with her. And now it's time for a pep talk. Today, I want to talk about balcony leadership. You see, as a principal, I found myself standing on the balcony of our main gym, looking down at the floor at least a few times a month. And not during a game. I'm talking about times when the gym was empty and I could be alone with my thoughts. After I started working with my leadership coach and became clearer about what the work really was, I realized I had to set time aside to actually reflect on my progress. The analogy of the balcony was so strong for me that I could look down on the floor and see in my mind's eye those things that I held most important in my role. These balcony sessions were necessary for me to remain clear and intentional with my work. I would ask questions of myself that connected to what I valued and what I felt was important. I'm curious, do you have a place where you check in on yourself? Do you have that clarity? Do you work intentionally towards those things that you really hold in high value? And if you don't, what steps do you need to take? Reach out and let's have a conversation if you need. Because leaders, if we don't have clarity, and if we're not intentional, and if we don't find that balcony level position where we can check in on ourselves, we're not leading on the road to awesome. Take it for what it's worth. That's what I got for you today, folks. Thanks so much for listening to the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. Uh, make sure you get down there, leave us a five-star review. I'd love to hear your thoughts, love to hear your ideas and your questions. Thanks so much, folks. Have a road to awesome week. Thank you for listening to the Leaning Into Leadership podcast, brought to you by Road to Awesome. Don't forget, click subscribe, give a review, and share this with somebody who might also enjoy leaning into leadership.